Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're uh, delighted. My name is Mark Duggan. I'm the director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. It's great to see many uh, friends of CEPR here and also many new faces as well. I'm really pleased that we are able to host uh, this event today uh, and to, to jointly uh, organize this with, uh, with Hoover. I believe, I, and John may be able to correct me if I'm wrong about this, that this is the first uh, joint event between Seeper and Hoover, certainly in, in, in many years, so I'm really delighted uh, to be doing it. And the timing, uh, given the topic, could, could hardly be better, given uh, what is happening uh, in the macro economy and with interest rates. Um, I just am going to just want to quickly say how uh, pleased that Seeper, one of the things that we take a lot of pride in is the support that we provide for, uh, for graduate students. We do many things, but this is a, is a big component of what we're about. And I was delighted to learn uh, from my colleague, John Taylor, about, uh, so our two speakers today, uh, both Volker and, and John, uh, received uh, support from CEPR uh, some years ago. So uh, first, I won't say how many, I was some years ago. I won't say quite how many, but the, uh, uh, both as research assistants, uh, and as uh, through, our, through our fellowship program. And I'm really proud that we've continued uh, those sorts of programs today. This year, we're providing support to more than 100 students at CEPR. And, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting. Uh, and, if it, and, and Volker and John are you know, pretty representative of how our students, uh, how things work out for our <laughs> students in the, in, in the future. So, uh, um, and I also understand from, from, John, from John Taylor that, uh, that both of them were thanked prominently in, the, in, a, in a little paper from some years ago also uh, uh, examining the Taylor rule. So in any case, uh, please, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really, I think we're in for a real treat today and am delighted to uh, also uh, now hand off to, uh, to, uh, to Tom here from Hoover. Thanks, everybody. My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the director of the Hoover Institution, and I just want to echo Mark's comment. I'm really delighted to be involved with this joint production between CEPR and Hoover. I think there's a lot of potential here. We should work on it even more. It's a great, great event. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a Saturday. I particularly want to thank uh, Linda and Ellen in the back, the staff who helped put this on for work giving up their Saturday for doing this. And echoing Mark again, I want to just say how much we appreciate the engagement that Volker and John have given to Hoover over the years. They stay involved with our monetary policy conference a lot. Uh, they've worked over the years on research, including things like the effect of stimulus on the economy. And we're so glad that you're engaged with us. We hope you can stay engaged in the future. Really looking forward to today's conversation. I'm sure it's going to be very stimulating. I'm going to turn it over to John Taylor now to introduce the speakers and carry on. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Tom and Mark, and uh, thanks for all you coming here on a, on a Saturday. It's, uh, it's something we found just an opportunity to discuss a very important topic of, the, of two people that are out there almost more than anyone in a debate that's going on about, uh, about this topic. I was thinking uh, it's, it's called our star is the language people, and this is kind of the our star wars right here. <laughs> And John reminded me I missed, it, missed the day, May 4th, by a couple of days, but that's OK. So uh, and let me also uh, echo what Tom and Mark said about uh, John and Volker's uh, long association with Stanford. Uh, they uh, got their PhDs in the same year, 1995, and have been involved in research in all different aspects of macroeconomics, monetary economics, and also at the very high-level uh, policy position. So as you know, John is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and a member of the Federal Open Market Committee. And Volcker is a member of the German Council of Economic Experts. So in addition to the policy research that uh, Sieper and Hoover are so supportive of, they have delivered with the uh, actual policy, which is, to me is huge. It's, it's one thing to talk about the research. It's the other thing is to get the research into practice. And so they've done that. So this topic, uh, the R-Star Wars, has, uh, has accelerated dramatically in the uh, last few years. And just to, by to indication, the committee that John Williams sits on, the Federal Market Committee, 
reduce what most people think of their estimate of R star from about maybe a little over four to about three. And in real terms, that's from two to one because the inflation target is two. So that's a, that's a large reduction in a relatively short period of time. And of course it affects one's expectation of where monetary policy is going if they think they're aiming in some sense to, to three rather than four, that's, that's quite a bit of difference. It affects the path and, and where you're actually going. And over, uh, my observation over time is it's affected financial markets quite a bit where, where things are going. And, and I think globally that's the case too because as, as you'll hear a bit from John, this is not just a US phenomenon that's being uncovered and it's one of the reasons that Volcker has been so active on this uh, with, with the, in, in Europe where it's a big issue as well. So in May, it couldn't be a, a more interesting topic from an economic perspective, couldn't be a more important topic from a policy and markets perspective. So, so the, the idea here is they will both give an opening, and we're going to start, we're going to alphabetical, so very tough to be alphabetical on this, but had to, had to go down a few digits to figure out. And you can fool people if you're not careful. Uh, but we're going to start with, with uh, Volcker Wieland and uh, your opening, maybe use some slides, that's fine. Yep. And then John uh, will open and then we'll have a, a bit of back and forth between them, point counterpoint. And I'll try to facilitate it if I possibly can. I probably could just sit back and let them go. But then you guys are quite welcome. And uh, this is meant to be a broader conversation. So please jump in. So Volcker. <clears throat> let me see if this. Yes. Well, first, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a real honor. Uh, I'm humbled, humbled by the presence of all of you uh, and of John and uh, John, so thank you. Um, there's a lot of agreement, so before we disagree, let's say one thing we agree about. Uh, what do we agree about? Interest rates are very low. <laughs> and uh, nominal interest rates. Right? And uh, real is already a different issue, but nominal interest rates are very low. And if you think they're low in the US, they're even lower in Germany. We just had an, a period where even 10-year government deals in Germany were negative. This is in an economy which is growing above potential and which has output above potential. Strange, right? Now, the debate is about, or the disagreement is about why. Is it monetary policy or is it other things? So it's an issue of it wasn't me, like if the central banks the Draghi says, it wasn't me. There is evidence it's something else. Or is it multi-policy? So uh, in terms of, you mentioned our council, I just want to throw in quickly that I'm not speaking for the German government. We're actually appointed by the government, but we are independent. So it's not like the CEA here. When we hand, our, hand over our report, it has titles such as against a backward-looking economic policy or time for reforms. So they're not quite as happy, uh, but it's supposed to be an institution which helps uh, sponsor a public, uh, public exchange and assessment. Now, um, coming to those things where there's a disagreement, um, what, what is this R star? Uh, it's basically a concept where that would be the equilibrium rate, uh, the real interest rate, in equilibrium basically when aggregate demand is equal to potential in a sustained way. So here uh, the red line is just an aggregate demand curve uh, in GDP interest rate space. And uh, you see the intersection, there is potential GDP, maybe you call it Y star, and then the R star is the interest rate at that point. Um, now, of course, is that something where it's gonna stay forever, or is it changing, or is it a short run, medium run, long run concept, all that would be things one could ask. Um, one could write a simple equation, and uh, there's one thing you see here pretty easily, is that if this R star changes, you know, this changes, uh, moves the equation here one for one, and the interest rate settles to a new equilibrium. So whatever the force is, if the R star changes, um, it moves this down, the new equilibrium, which may be reached after some time, or immediately, depending uh, what it is, um, is at a lower level of this neutral rate, of this R star, where, where multi-policy, you know, if they want to ease, they would go below. Um, and so Draghi tells us in Europe, well, it's negative, and so we have to go below. Um, that's, that's basically the, the discussion. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and you could say, well, is this temporary? Is this permanent? So those would be, would be important issues to think about. 
And uh, in fact, something uh, we're going to talk about, which uh, Thomas Laubach, uh, also at some time a colleague in Frankfurt, and John Williams have done early on in their work in 2003, is provide estimates which are basically sophisticated versions of this accurate demand curve and you try to find this uh, intersection. And uh, the method, you know, they wrote this in 2003 and then they've been working on it more and it kind of dropped in 2009, their estimate. So it's just like in the chart, it drops down. So we're in a new world. If this is permanent, then uh, interest rates are going to be lower permanently and, you know, the Fed or the ECB, they need to be going even below that if they want to stimulate the economy, and they need to do that more often than in the past. And this has had a huge policy impact. Um, Larry Summers in 2014 said, the LW methodology, Lava Williams, demonstrates a very substantial and continuing decline in the equilibrium rate of interest. He actually thought of a permanent thing. He says, and he associates it with this permanent secular or long run secular stagnation growth, not only the R star moves, but the Y star moves, the growth rate associated with that moves down and we're stuck there and multi-policy can't even go low enough and that keeps us even below that. So you have a negative output gap and this is just a depression. And so you need, only can get out of there if you have massive, massive expansion of government spending. So a very powerful uh, policy recommendation based on that. Paul Krugman actually uh, argued that he had that idea maybe even first, but didn't say it so loudly. Um, <laughs> that's what he wrote, I think. <laughs> He's not here, so I can say things like that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and he said in this, look at this, if Paul Krugman says that, it's almost like certainty. He says the low natural rate is as solid a result as anything in real time can be, referring to the Lava Williams estimate I just showed you. And Janet Yellen, importantly, here um, as an acting policymaker here uh, in 2015 at CEPR, uh, gave a speech, uh, and she's given a speech again in 2017, where she said the following, under assumptions that I consider more realistic under present circumstances than, I'll tell you in a moment what she means by more, but she considers those realistic, the Taylor rule calls for the federal funds rate to be close to zero, which just happened to be the level at the time, so it says, well, it's consistent with that rule. I think it's fantastic that uh, Janet Yellen and others on the FMC are Explaining policy in the context of such rules, I think that's really useful. Um, and it also gives ways to argue about it, which I'll try to do. Now, one thing I wanted to mention, um, how does here, you know, what does Jan Yell mean with the Taylor rule? This was actually also on the agenda for Laba Williams. They said, well, we're trying to estimate something which is a reference point in the long run also for this Taylor rule. So this back then when we were as RAs working here and um, also helped a little bit on on doing charge or things like that, I don't know. Um, th that, that was this 93 paper, and so this is really directly copied out of it. And um, there is a two, and that actually was the estimate for the R star in that, for, in that uh, uh, rule. And it, you know, it, I mean, here the R is the federal funds rate, it's a nominal rate, and it responds to inflation, inflation deviations from target and output gaps, and it has this reference point. And it was basically a assumed steady state growth rate from which it was taken, right? From a steady state, long run growth rate of GDP. Uh, and it also happened to be at the time about 2% if you just looked at the average real federal funds rate. And in fact, if you look now, if you take this whole sample from 65 to 2015, it's still about 2% on there. And the potential growth rate, uh, sorry, and, and the average growth rate uh, per capita GDP is a bit lower, uh, GDP is a little higher. So that's, that's not that different either, if you take this full sample. But now we have John's estimate. It's dropped to zero. But what I wanted to say, there's a huge degree of imprecision and sensitivity. Um, I show you the imprecision. Now I have to kind of expand the chart. So the orange line is what you saw before. The orange line is the R star estimate from Labach Williams. It moves down in 2009. I need more space because this takes on the, the you know, pl plots also uh, the blue line, which is a smooth version of it, which, uh, which is a two-sided estimate, and then the uncertainty bands around it. And if you look at the 95% confidence interval, for example, here in the, in the 90, late 90s when we were here, um, it was, the estimate was 4%, and uh, it, the, the answer, it could have been, uh, if you take a 95% confidence interval, it could have been 7%, it could have been uh, minus 2%. 
but there wasn't much talk about it then. But so there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. And to be fair, I should say, in the, in the 2003 paper and also subsequent word, uh, uh, Thomas and John always referred to that high degree of uncertainty. However, you know, if you go back to these uh, people, they haven't really mentioned uh, this uncertainty. I, I, I checked, I mean, I, I couldn't find it. Maybe I didn't search long enough in the, in the text. So in the policy debate, I think that has got lost to a good extent. So that's one point I want to make. It's unusually high in precision if you compare to other unobservable objects, potential output, the Nairu. This is another level of uncertainty. So I, I think it shouldn't be really driving such major policy decisions such as what Larry Summers wanted. Uh, or I would be skeptical about uh, using it in quite the way Janet Yellen has used it. And I want to make a second point on that. Um, so for example, when Janet Yellen used it, and I thought it was very commendable that it does this discussion in the context of rules, uh, but she used it uh, with an output gap where I think the two things don't fit together. So here is what she used, you know, you have to put things into the Taylor rule. And I think it's useful to be able to have that discussion, right? So I think one can have disagreement, right? So and then one can actually uh, put it at something. So she put in core PCE inflation about 2%. Um, this come down, uh, this is from the 80s till now. And she uses this blue output gap, which is calculated from her long run Nairu estimate. So it's a long run output gap. And so there's a big um, deviation below, output way below potential in 2010, slowly coming back. Right? Now, actually in the uh, estimation, and it, I, I shouldn't say it's just Laba Williams, if other people use that framework with statistical methods, they can get similar, similar results. Uh, but the output gap estimate actually looks like this. That's the orange line. So uh, associated with this decline in this R star, according to that methodology, that time series uh, methodology, you also get a decline in potential growth. You get a decline in the level of potential, or it doesn't grow as much. So the output gap, the orange line, actually is zero already in 2011, 12 and positive thereafter. So when you plug these, so there's a big difference. And so if you use the orange output gap, which is the consistent one with this equilibrium rate estimate, if you use those two together in the Taylor rule, you actually get more agreement, right? So the blue line here is the Fed funds rate. The orange line, there's a more standard Taylor rule, which says that you know, interest rates should be higher. Um, and uh, this Yellen Taylor rule version, where she said in 2015, well, if I plug in the 0% equilibrium rate, then I'm at zero. Um, now, if you plug in the output gap estimate from John and Thomas, uh, it's positive. It's not negative. So the disagreement with the standard Taylor, Taylor rule gets smaller. So this is the light green. Green is uh, the color of hope. Right? It's light. Anyway, the consistent Yellen Taylor rule is closer. Uh, to the orange one, so less disagreement. And actually, it, was, it never went down as far. So uh, I, I, I haven't gotten a good answer uh, so far why, why, why one should use these, two, these measures inconsistently, the output gap and the interest rate. Now, going forward, I, if I have a, a, I'm not going to be much longer. But I thought, as a third thing, I should also bring different estimates. Right? So of course, if I use the same technique as uh, Thomas and others, and uh, John, I would get similar results. So I'm not saying uh, they did anything which is not directly reproducible or replicable. Um, but so what I'm saying is let's focus more on this long run. Uh, just like in this original Taylor rule, the idea was it's a long run equilibrium. It's this point, where are we going back to in, if you look at a 10 year yield, you may want to think, where, what's, where, what's it, what is it tending back to in year 10? Um, and you can use uh, structural models to do that. So I'm using two models. I'm just showing you one. Uh, one is from before the crisis. This is this one. And the other one is from after the crisis, financial crisis. And one actually can calculate a steady state real interest rate from that. And it's different. It, it is uh, quite uh, often different from a, just a simple average. Um, and if you look at this Christiana Angbaum Evans Metzwaters model in the original version, so they use data from 66 to 2004, they get an estimate of three. Uncertainty bands around these long run estimates are much smaller, so a little bit, you know, about plus, plus minus one. Um, so clearly positive. Uh, different from the mean, if you just take the mean over that period, it would have been 2.6, the mean of the real interest rate. Um, and if you take different samples in 79, it was 2.5, the estimate. Uh, if you take the full sample till today, it's 2.2. Uh, 
um, mean a little lower, 1.9 here, uh, from 84 to 16, 2.18. So, and clearly positive, clearly well above zero, and the US rate is pretty important for the world, so clearly well above the negative values uh, you know, ECB officials are referring to. Now, uh, one picture, so these models, you may say of all these models, there are things they capture. We could use them to ask about why are uh, average rates lower than this equilibrium. Um, and we could use them um, for a bunch of things, but they may still uh, miss important trend changes, important, important structural breaks. They may think, you know, labor productivity is there's some steady state, but maybe that has changed or, or uh, other trend changes. And so we just said, well, a simple way to look at that is to, to re-estimate the models over shorter samples to see if there's been any break in things which are not modeled. And so I need to say a few things about this chart. So first, there's a constant line at three. This is, this is the original estimate from that model if you take it from 66 to 2004, right? That's the dash dot line. Now, the dotted line, which drops down uh, to zero in 2009, is the Lauer-Williams estimate coming not from this model, but from a, from, a, from a simpler model, but with more statistical techniques, which basically allow to capture time variation in that rate. Now, the solid line is basically re-estimating this model, figure out a long run real interest rate every quarter with whatever data was available in that quarter for the last 20 years. And then you move forward one quarter, you move the 20 year window forward, and so on. So it requires estimating these models many, many times with the actually available real time data. And then you can see from, what, from that perspective, what does the model tell you is the long run things are converging to. And that can change, right, depending on the data. And so most recently, you know, it's, it's around 2%, so it has declined a bit. But what you see is it has declined much less than the dashed line. The dashed line is kind of in the middle. The dashed line gives you the average real interest rate over those 20-year windows. So the, the last point will be the average real interest rate over the period from 2017 to, um, to 1997. Right? Uh, that's a, we have 10 years of crisis in there, so that average has gone down to 0.45%. So now the question which I, which I posed in the beginning, is it some force in the economy, a change in equilibrium, or is it monetary policy? In this model, you can ask that question, and it tells you the difference here is about 50% monetary policy, so multi-policy here in the last few years was considered easy, you know, accommodative, stimulative. And if you do that for Europe, it's even more, uh, more it would be even more dramatic. Uh, it's just harder to estimate those things for Europe because you know, we're different countries, one multi-policy, different data. It's a difficult world. Anyway, uh, the 25% is risk premium shocks. Why is that? <laughs> Basically, risk premium went up a lot in the recession, right, causing the recession. And they are very persistent according to those models. So it takes a long time to come out. So those are the main forces according to this. So here it really says, so if the central bank's answer is, it wa like, it wasn't me, it's too many savings in China or in Germany depressing the equilibrium rate and we have to go under it. So if that's what, what also President Draghi is saying, uh, then here we would say, no, it's uh, monetary policy to a big extent, and maybe you should look at the Taylor rule and you should start easing or um, you know, think about where you're gonna go in the long run and maybe it's not so low. So my conclusions, I think uh, this are, uh, these estimates, particularly these, I would say, medium run estimates, an important distinction is uh, if you think econometrically, these estimates by Lava Williams and others are more focusing on the medium run. Um, that's where you get the large uncertainty, so you should treat it with extreme caution. And I think it has gotten, gotten too much play in major policy decisions or major policy uh, you know, uh, positions, at least, if you, if you think of the example with Summers. And um, I think in terms of multi-policy, you should not make it the main focus of multi-policy because then you're gonna end up with a very model and shock dependent. So if you thought I talked too much about models, it basically makes policy very model and shock dependent. And to figure out the shocks, you also need a model, right? Um, so I think, you know, the, in this rule we looked at before, you know, responding to inflation, responding to output or output growth, that's where the main focus should be. The uncertainty should take much more uh, front stage in the policy discussion. If, you, if I look at Europe, uh, 
a big justification for the multi-policy right now is there's lots and lots of political uncertainty. Why don't they talk about the uncertainty uh, about the R-star? Uh, they didn't talk about that. Um, and uh, maybe they'll, if, you think, if you say, okay, how are we going to go forward? Either way, I think one should think of strategies or rules which either don't need such an equilibrium rate or um, focus more on the long run as a reference point. So that's my, my points. So I have to click through some extra slides so John can go straight to his. <laughs> so don't, uh, don't uh, look. So. Okay, thank you, Volker. John Williams, yeah. John Williams is next. Great. Let me just uh, add to what Volker said, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that I do brag about, even though it's been now 24 uh, years, is that I am in a footnote on the famous Taylor Rule paper. <laughs> and I will tell you, the, my research assistants are, find that awesome. So uh, it is definitely, uh, uh, and I want to start there too, because a, a serious point. The, John's paper from 93, his research before that, that led to that paper, because as an RA, you know, uh, he'd worked on his book uh, and a lot of work he did um, then and since then, uh, has really transformed the discussion around monetary policy. When I joined the Federal Reserve in 1994, coming straight out of Stanford, there was still this discussion in, among policymakers and the staff to think about monetary policy is one-off decisions. Should we raise rates or lower rates uh, or, or leave them the same? And, 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 and over time, I mean, this, this Taylor rule idea uh, basically uh, just swept through the world of central banking, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And that led to a changing in thinking instead of about tactics, thinking about strategy, thinking about creating a long-run uh, strategy that uh, anchors inflation expectations and, and gets good macroeconomic outcomes. Uh, in a, a variety of circumstances. So that was a very exciting time for Volcker and me coming into the Fed because everyone was, a lot of people were, were excited about Taylor, Taylor rules and thinking about this strategy and we did a lot of research, especially uh, together and also Volcker on his own research, uh, looking at thinking about policy under uncertainty. So here's where he and I com completely agree that when you think about policy strategy, you really have to realize there's a great deal of uncertainty about the the world out there, including about this one part of the Taylor rule, uh, which is R star. So I completely agree with that. But uh, you know, in, in some ways, this whole Star Wars uh, debate we're having now in, in 2017 is because of the Taylor rule, right? I mean, because when you think about a Paul having a coherent long-term strategy, and the the as uh, Volker showed, there was that number two there. There was another two, the inflation target, but there was a two at the end, which is a no of the neutral or equilibrium or natural rate of interest in the long run. And that became uh, a center of discussion among policymakers. And the reason I started working on this project actually was Governor Larry Meyer uh, asked us at the staff uh, to say, you know, Taylor Rule is really important. I want to think about that. I want to analyze monetary policy in the context of a Taylor Rule. But this notion of two being the intercept or the na uh, natural rate, or uh, so how should I think about that? Now, we, let's put, go back in time. This was during the period of the productivity acceleration, the uh, dot com boom, the you know the late 90s. And the debate then is, is has R star gone up? And maybe two is too low, and maybe because we're in a faster growing economy, stronger economy, we really need to think about an equilibrium rate that's, that's higher. And that's really what the, the, why we started working on that. Um, and if you looked at uh, Volcker's chart of uh, the last chart, you'll see that there's this movement up in these estimates of our story. Well, that's in the late 90s uh, during the, the uh, productivity uh, boom. So, Roll time forward, and lo and behold, this topic comes back 15, uh, well, a dozen years later, but it's the opposite question. It's not is, is the, maybe the Taylor rule, we need to adjust it to raise the intercept in terms of the neutral rate, but maybe we need to lower it. So I'm going to very briefly go through uh, um, just two slides of estimates of um, the natural rate of interest, but I, um, and I'll uh, and make a couple comments to pick up on uh, Volcker's last slide about what are we, what should we uh, think about in terms of policy. Um, oh right, there's this thing on the bottom. I'm, I'm going to say it out loud. The views expressed here are those of the author, author and do not re necessarily reflect those of anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. Um, 
And, uh, but this is, this is uh, a lot of this can be based on my joint work with Thomas Laubach, who's at the board. So this is, um, this is slide number one. Um, this is a comparison. I think you can see it. The, the gray shaded region shows um, uh, the high, the range, high to low at each point in time, of five different estimate, estimates of this natural rate of interest, or R star, from different models. One is Laubach Williams, others from uh, colleagues of mine at the Richmond Fed using a very different methodology, a very actually more sophisticated methodology. Uh, Johansson Mertens are colleagues of mine at the Fed who use financial market data, uh, and then work by Hol uh, Catherine Holston and Thomas and I, uh, and then by, by Mike Kiley. So we take five different types of models, different estimates. Amongst us, we argue a lot because this is, you know, the R star world, so we're fighting over this. But the, the big picture is kind of interesting, and that is, and, and, and uh, Folker made this point already, that in this group of, of models that are, that you, you find that they have similar patterns over time. They used to typically be around two to three percent. They w move up and down. This is going from 1986 to the most current estimates through the third quarter of last year. Uh, and then, um, but you do see this trend decline in the, in the 80s and early 90s, around three, uh, moving down to around two in the mid-2000s, and now the mean estimate here is roughly half a percent. Um, now, there is this question. This is not showing the uncertainty around every individual estimate. It's just showing the range of estimates. So each of these estimates, as, as Volker said, are, are have statistical uncertainty around them. But it is striking that whatever is happening, whatever has been happening in the economy in the last 30 years, is showing up in all these various different models is an appearance of a lower normal or equilibrium real federal funds rate. Um, now, the, uh, th there is this question of is statistically, is this a change? I mean, if you go from two and a half down to half, is that, you know, given the big air bands? And so some colleagues of mine at the New York Fed have recently written a paper at Brookings uh, that delved into this uh, a lot. And uh, they, they argue, at least in their model, that this is a statistically significant decline in, in R star. But even if it, you know, we, if we step away from that kind of very uh, technical uh, question, if you're a policymaker and you're using, the, the, want to use a Taylor rule or some version of a Taylor rule uh, as kind of a guide to think about the economy, uh, and, and you're taking what I would call, you know, typically it's described as a Bayesian view, um, a Bayesian would say the estimate has gotten lower. Uh, there, it's uncertain, but it has gotten lower, and uh, at least on, a, on face value in a standard uh, linear quadratic framework that we use, then you're, you should be using a lower uh, estimate of R star. Um, so it's, you, we can debate the big error bands, but you really have to be making a pretty subtle argument that says that the fact that you have uncertainty about your, your R star should mean that you ignore the evidence uh, that it's declined. Um, the second point I want to make, and this is slide uh, two, and this is it, is that the, this is not just happening in the United States. So this is a paper Catherine Holston and uh, Thomas Laubach and I did last year. The black line is a weighted average where we use GDPs in each of the regions of, let's see, we have Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Euro area. So those four economies together make much, much, make up much of the advanced economies. Actually, the only big economy that we're not including is Japan. Um, so what you see here is a very similar pattern that you saw in the U.S. Of course, the U.S. is a big chunk of this. That's just that's f f uh, the fact. But what we see in our paper is that the estimates of R star are actually declining in Canada, the U.K., Euro area, and the U.S. Um, and then you take the weighted average today, they've gone from about 2%, 2 to 2.5%, down to today a quarter of a percent. Again, the air bands on these estimates would be very large, um, uh, as Volcker highlighted, but the, the delta um, uh, comes out pr pretty loud and clear. Now, the, la the question that people are asking today, which I think is the, the uh, really important question, is why? So a lot of the economists here at Stanford, around the uh, country, around the world, are really thinking harder about not just in terms of my model or some other model, but how do I? What's changing in the global economy that would be pushing down a natural rate? So I think right now there are three main um, contenders. I think all, personally. Uh, I guess I am a Bayesian. I think all three of them play an important role. One is, is this trend growth. So the red line here shows our model estimates of the trend real GDP growth, again, averaged over these four regions, uh, falling from about 25 to 3% 20, 30 years ago, now down to about 1.5%. Uh, that would be true of the US as well, but it's true in, in countries around the world. 
Um, and that's just lower productivity growth, uh, lower labor force growth. The second is demographics. Uh, we are getting older, uh, not only as individuals, but as societies. Um, and there is both kind of theory and evidence that suggests uh, that a uh, uh, economy made up of people with longer life expectancies uh, will tend to save more on that, um, and that will tend to uh, generate greater savings and, and push down the neutral interest rate in the way that Volcker had that nice uh, kind of aggregate demand curve an analysis. The third is what's often called a risk, uh, um, risk premium or convenience yield or safe asset story, uh, where basically since the financial crisis, has been, or over the last few decades, uh, there's a higher uh, premium on risky assets like, uh, like stocks and bonds relative to the interest rates that central banks use to transact on the Fed funds rate, LIBOR rates, things like that, which tend to have very relatively low, uh, be considered safe assets. And so that tends to push the yield on safe assets relative to other assets down. Go back to my colleagues at the, the New York Fed and, and, and uh, look at other models. I would argue, similar to, similarly to what um, uh, Volcker said, is you know, real side factors such as trend growth, productivity, demographics are probably explaining half or two thirds of the decline in the natural rate that we're seeing across countries. I think the safe asset story has some part of that. It's a very subtle story. There's a really, uh, really nice paper by Bob Hall here at Stanford that uh, talks about uh, basically distribution uh, across people, uh, across the global economy. It's, I think it fits into the safe asset story in terms of pushing down the, the natural rate of interest. So I think we're getting better understanding of why these things are happening. And I think importantly, these stories, I call them stories, just talking about it, they, most of them, I would say, are things that are probably not going to reverse in the next five to 10 years. Uh, demographics, we know that's very predictable. Productivity growth, according to my colleague John Fernald and other experts, seems to no signs of a pickup there. And some of the safe asset kind of, or, or Bob Hall stories, I think that those factors are probably gonna stay in play uh, and unlikely to reverse uh, going uh, far in the future. So what, is, what does this mean for monetary policy? It means it's really hard to conduct a Taylor rule type policy uh, if our star really is uh, uh, in the, the, a quarter of a percent. Uh, I know the, the FOMC, my colleagues, our median view of this is one, but you know, again, I'm, you know, there's a lot of estimates that are below one, some that are above. Uh, and I think we do need to have a serious discussion about how do you conduct monetary policy when the next recession hits, and we could start, uh, even at a strong economy, we might start the next recession with an interest rate of two or three uh, percent as a starting point and, and, and having very little room to cut. Uh, I, I gave a, I will give you a 30 second version of the paper I gave yesterday when I was in New York uh, City uh, and uh, for a conference or event, and uh, it's very much aligned with what Volcker said at the end. We need to think about strategies in monetary policy that both deal with a low uh, value of R-star, potentially, but also the uncertainty about R-star. So I put out in, the, in the, my talk and I, on my presentation a view that taking a Taylor rule but changing in one way and to adapt it to a, a world where R star is potentially very low, but also very uncertain, and that is to have a price level target instead of an inflation rate target. Uh, and what a price level target basically does is it says that if you miss your target, you have to make that up uh, in the future. So on average, over 5, 10, 20, 30 years, the price level will, will um, consistently be at this target rate. Um, and that basically creates far less uncertainty about inflation over the medium and longer term. Uh, it also is well adapted for reasons I talked about in my, uh, my talk to an environment of very low interest rates. Now, I think that uh, I want to reiterate what Volcker said. It's not just about a low R star. The research that Athanasios Orphanese and I and others have done has highlighted in a world of uncertainty that thinking about a price level target strategy rather than an inflation target strategy, um, I think is better suited from a robustness point of view. Um, and I'll, but I'll leave it at that and I invite anyone to go to the frbsf.org website and look at the talk I gave yesterday. Uh, but again, thank you. I'm looking forward to okay. the discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you.